Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This documentary seeks to analyze and look at the holy city of Medina, this important city that was beloved to the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his holy progeny, the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as-salam. We will look at the history of the city together with the important events, of course, that happened and occurred during a lifetime of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt in that area. The significance of the visitation of the shrine of the Holy Prophet and as well as the Ahlul Bayt He lived and died for us, what have I done? I have forsaken his life, I have abandoned his way. Oh Allah, now my time has come. Deep in my heart I feel a change has begun Deep in my soul I feel the warmth of the sun Burning bright with Iman on the road to Ihsan All my obstacles I will overcome Peace be upon Rasulullah Peace be upon Habibullah Peace be upon Muhammad Peace be upon Shafi Allah Peace be upon Khair Khalilah Peace be upon Muhammad Masjid al-Nabawi here in the holy city of Medina has a number of important historical events in Islamic history that are relevant to the lives of human beings but also that the Quran speaks about and at the same time we find that the Ahl al-Bayt gave much lessons and disseminated the uloom of Ali Muhammad in Masjid al-Nabawi to the people who benefited from their presence and their excellence when it comes to devotion and knowledge. At the same time, pilgrims who come to the city of Medina also pay their respects together with visiting the Holy Prophet's grave and his famous mosque, seeking the intercession of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidatul Nisa, Fatima alayhi salam, and the Imma alayhi wa salam, in accordance with the teachings of the Quran, such as Surah Al Nisa, chapter 4. Verse number 64 أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمَ الرَّسُولِ لَوَجَدُوا اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا The Quran says those who oppress themselves and commit injustice if they come to seek istighfar and repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet himself also forgives them they will find Allah oft merciful, of forgiving Together with this they also come to pay their respects and perform the ziyarah of the demolished graves of Immatul Baqir. The city of Medina, the city that welcomed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, the one where the majority of Islamic commands were revealed to the Holy Prophet after the establishment of the Islamic State the place where the Prophet of Islam chose to remain despite the conquest of Mecca and the area in which the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt loved. Indeed, you look at the holy city of Medina, the realization is it holds a special status when it comes to Islamic history as well as the understanding of the lives of the Ma'sumin alayhum salam. It is mentioned three times in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, mentions وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ مَرَدُوا عَلَى النفاق in chapter 9, Surah Tawbah. From the people of Medina, there are those who are stern in hypocrisy. At the same time, we recognize that the city was called Yathrib, but named al Medina by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny. It is approximately 430 kilometers away from the city of Mecca, and in approximately 586 BC, some of the Jews migrated there and established themselves as merchants selling commodities such as 
gold. There are, of course, uh, indications at the same time that when they m migrated to Yathrib or that area, there were Arabs already present. In approximately 532 before Christ, the Arab tribes of Aus and Khazraj settled down in that city and they remained there of course, many of them had received the indications and the teachings from the prophets that there will be a final and the greatest of prophets sent from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala who will reside here. In the year 620 AD, the community of Yathrib sent some, some delegation to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam and subsequently two years later during the Hajj pilgrimage. And of course what happened there is that the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him and his holy progeny, was commanded by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to move to the city of Yathrib and this was the initiation of the migration, the Hijrah. It was 11 years after the revelation that the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him and his holy progeny had received from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Archangel Jibra'il. A man by the name of As'ad ibn Zurara met the Holy Prophet in Mecca during the Hajj pilgrimage. He embraced the religion of Islam and of course pledged his allegiance to the Holy Prophet. Only two years later approximately, the second Bay'atul Aqaba as it's known was formed by representatives from the inhabitants of the city of Medina with the Holy Prophet during the pilgrimage. Therefore, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam decided to send them a man by the name of Mus'ab ibn Umair. He was young, approximately 19 years of age, a man who had embraced the religion of Islam despite the resistance of his parents and the fact that he was known uh, amongst the family that was fairly well off. Mus'ab ibn Umair was known as a reciter of the Holy Quran who went to Medina, Yathrib, he invited people towards the religion. When he invited them, they listened. They asked him to recite the beautiful verses of the Holy Book. Some of them embraced the religion of Islam upon the recitation that he had performed. At the same time, others slightly resisted Yet Mus'ab ibn Umair was largely successful and the time was there for the Prophet of Islam to move to Medina. Of course, the Holy Prophet had faced together with the Muslims in Mecca severe persecution. Some were killed, many were tortured. Some had been sent by the Holy Prophet to the land of Abyssinia whereby they were protected by the Christian king Najashi. Yet of course the Prophet of Islam wanted to establish the first Islamic government or state. Therefore, 13 years after the receiving of the revelation, when the Prophet of Islam was 53 years of age, he moved from the city of Mecca after receiving the warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was about to be executed or there was a plan from Quraysh to eliminate him. Indeed, this was the beginning of the migration where the Prophet asked Imam Ali alayhi salam to sleep on his bed. When he did so, these individuals had come at night to attack Rasulullah but they found Amir al-Mu'mineen willing to sacrifice his life for the sake of the religion of Islam 
and the Holy Prophet. The Prophet of Islam made his way from Mecca towards the city of Medina, leaving Mecca with a heavy heart. Narrations say that he wept and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him that indeed he will return one day to see the city of his birth, Mecca, again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the way to the city of Medina, whereby he hid uh, in the cave and when he was followed by Quraysh who um, had uh, sought the help of an individual who is an expert in tracking others, they came to a uh, cave and they recognized that there was a spider's uh, web as well as the a nest of certain birds and therefore they um, left that particular cave where the Prophet of Islam had remained. This cave is known as part of Jabal An nur found on the outsk outskirts of the city of Mecca. The Prophet وسلم, reached the outskirts of Medina on the 12th of uh, Rabi'ul Awwal, the first year of migration, first year after Hijrah. And of course, the place where he resided is known as Quba. There he remained for 15 days. The place belonged to the tribe of Bani ibn Awf al Ansari. And it was here that the Prophet ﷺ waited for Imam Ali alayhi salam who left the city of Mecca three days after Rasulullah with Sayyida Fatima, with his mother Fatima bint Asad, as well as Fatima, the daughter of Hamza, according to narrations, or others say uh, the uh, Fatima daughter of Zubair ibn Awam. The Prophet there also encouraged in Quba for the building of a mosque. Therefore, Quba Mosque, was indeed the first mosque to be built and the uh, merits of this particular mosque is that the Quran in chapter 9 Surah Tawbah verse number 107 refers to this mosque la masjidun ussisa ala taqwa min awwal yawmin ahqqu an taquma fihi it's a mosque which was formed upon purity and god consciousness the Ahl al-Bayt have emphasized the importance of this mosque. You'll find that, for instance, Imam Ja'far Sadiq salam, he was asked about the importance of Masjid Quba. He said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam would say, whoever prays a two-unit salah in Masjid Quba will attain the reward of the performance of a Umrah. Therefore, hundreds of thousands of people across the year visit this mosque and perform their prayers and supplicate to their Lord. Masjid al Quba, the first mosque to be built in the history of the religion of Islam. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, reached the holy city of Medina, he waited for the arrival of Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib and Sayyidat al Nisa Fatima, peace and blessings be upon them, together with others. Here in Quba, a mosque was built. The Quran in chapter 9, Surah Tawbah, verse 107 and 108, talks about the essential qualities of this mosque. This is a mosque built on God consciousness, taqwa, and should be the one that the Prophet and the Muslims perform their prayers in. This purity element was mentioned as important in this particular mosque. It was built in an area of Bani Salim. And the narrations tell us that whomsoever comes here and performs Ruk'atain Salah, they obtain the reward of the performance of an Umrah. The Prophet ﷺ would continuously come here and also pray the Salah. Muslims, hundreds of thousands through the year, also make it part of an important journey to come here and to witness 
the mosque that has gone through a number of renovations, yet it stands as the first mosque in Islamic history. People were in great anticipation. There was joy and happiness. Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was to arrive in the holy city of Medina, otherwise known as Yathrib. There were many people who were anticipating his arrival. When he eventually reached Medina, there was the recitation of the lines of poetry, al Badru Alayna, that the light and the moon has just emerged. We have seen him. When he came, it was the important task of building a place to stay and a mosque. There was a land that belonged to two orphans. The Prophet purchased that land. Many had wanted Rasulullah to stay with them. Yet the construction of the mosque, Masjid al Nabawi, the great mosque in the holy city of Medina, the mosque whereby today any type of worship is more valuable than 10,000 anywhere else except Masjid al Haram in Mecca, the Kaaba. This mosque, its construction, was commanded by the Holy Prophet and all the companions and those who were there began helping Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to build it. They used all kinds of different material and through collective measures and uh, relentless efforts over a period of time, the mosque of the Holy Prophet in Medina was constructed. After approximately 15 days, at Quba and when Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam with the Fawatim arrived in that area, the Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, moved towards central Medina, so to speak. And he was welcomed extensively through jubilant celebrations by the inhabitants of Yathrib, as it was called then. Everybody wanted the Prophet to stay with them in Yathrib. But of course, the decision was to build this grand mosque known as Al Masjid Al Nabawi, the Prophet's mosque in Medina. What the Prophet did was he commanded that his camel is allowed to walk freely and choose a location. And that location would be where the mosque would be constructed. The camel reached an area owned by uh, two orphans from Bani Najjar. The Prophet of Islam purchased that land from them and ordered that the palm trees are cut down and the graves of the polytheists that they were there are relocated. He paid 10 dinars to the orphans and those looking after them and the construction of the mosque began. Many took part, but importantly, Rasulullah himself was seen working with the others. They used stones, joined together with cement and the pillars were made out of palm tree trunks whilst also several doors were made. At that time the size of the mosque was approximately 30 meters squared but later it was expanded to 50 meters squared. This expansion occurred in the year 7 after Hijra where the Prophet returned from Khaybar and the number of Muslims of course had increased. There were no minarets uh, at that time and the adhan that would be recited by Bilal would be on the roof of a house that was adjacent. There were of course no carpets and no rugs during the time of the Holy Prophet in the mosque itself and the Prophet of Islam would emphasize that the companions and the Muslims inside the mosque must perform their prayers on the soil itself, even not allowing the usage of cloth or the cloaks of the Muslims when it comes to placing their foreheads onto the ground. One of the first things that the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny did was this important action of uniting the Muslims through brotherhood. There were the migrants and there were the helpers 
Al-Muhajirin Wal-Ansar. So the Prophet of Islam called upon each one of them to stand in brotherhood and in unity with the other, one migrant with one of the helpers. Indeed, this happened in a great show of cohesion and strength. Yet Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam stood there with no brother. The Prophet of Islam looked and Amir al-Mu'mineen was somehow saddened. He said to him, why are you saddened? He said, the response was, I do not have a brother. And the Prophet of Islam would say to him, Ya Ali, anta akhi fi dunya wal akhirah. O Ali, you are my brother in this world and the hereafter. Therefore, Muslim narrations and historians emphasize that in this act of brotherhood, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam chose Amir al-Mu'mineen as his brother and the Quran indeed affirms this when it talks about the incident of Mubahala where it refers to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam as Nafsu Rasulillah, the soul of the Holy Prophet, Anfusana wa Anfusakum. This magnificent mosque of the Holy Prophet witnessed a number of important events and incidents during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet recorded by Sunni and Shia historians and traditions. One of those was the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Holy Prophet to close all the doors that were adjacent to the mosque that led to the mosque of the Holy Prophet from the houses of the companions. This of course was from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala yet there was an exception and that was the door that led to the mosque and opened up to the mosque that belonged to the house of Imam Ali alayhi salam was indeed left and it was not closed. And this was part of a series of indications and strong messages to the community, to the Muslim Ummah, to recognize the most superior companion and the closest person to the Holy Prophet and that was Imam Ali alayhi salam. Uh, the decision, the announcement was made by Rasulullah in the mosque itself. Some uh, objected, some would say why? And the Prophet would say that this is indeed from the Almighty, not from myself. The first major battle that the Prophet of Islam and the Muslims had fought was Badr and they achieved tremendous victory, of course, through the courageous and uh, brilliant leadership of the Holy Prophet, and at the same time, the bravery of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, who killed half of those from Quraysh who were slain in Badr. Yet, of course, this was devastating for Quraysh, they felt humiliated and Abu Sufyan, the head of Quraysh in Mecca, had ordered that there would be no mourning for those who were killed except that revenge is sought. Therefore, in the month of Shawwal, three years after Hijra, an army of approximately 3,000 fighters from Quraysh, from the polytheists, coming from Mecca, marched towards Medina. And they wanted to attack the Muslims and annihilate the religion of Islam. The Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam, he took an army initially of 1,000 combatants. And after the discussion he had with the Muslims as to whether they should remain in Medina or go outskirts of Medina, the decision was to leave the city and to go to the mountainous region of Uhud. In that place, the two armies met. It was on the 7th of Shawwal, three years after the migration of the Holy Prophet. The Prophet of Islam had a plan. The plan was to place certain archers on a small mount that was somehow be behind 
where the Muslim army were stationed. This was to prevent an attack from behind by the Qurayshi army. There, he placed a man by the name of Abdullah Jabir with a number of archers to protect the Muslims. What happened was that the Qurayshi army were motivating their soldiers with drums, music, women, and other things. And when it, it came to the commencement of the battle, a man by the name of Talha ibn Abi Talha emerges from the army of Quraysh. He challenges the Muslims for a duel. According to historians such as Tabari and others, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, answers this challenge. This man Talha, together with his brothers and several other flag bearers, are eliminated and are killed by Amir al-Mu'mineen, which gave a massive morale boost to the Muslims. The cries of Allahu Akbar could be heard everywhere around that area. And of course, this demoralized the non-Muslim army. The battle began. And the Muslims were ahead. They were on the verge of victory. And when this happened, they were advancing the Archers placed on that particular mount recognized that Muslims were taking booties and the spoils of war. They did not listen to their commander Abdullah Jabir and many of them left their posts leaving only 10 archers on that small mount. When Khalid bin Walid who was fighting with the Quraysh army recognized that there aren't many in that particular mount and it was a place to attack the Muslims, he took his cavalry and he attacked the Muslims from behind, killing those 10 archers. Muslims were now running and wanting to save their lives and they began retracting. Certain individuals came to stand next to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At the forefront was Amir al-Mu'mineen Alayhi salam was seeking to protect and defend the religion of Islam and the Prophet from any harm. He was fighting ferociously next to the Holy Prophet when Rasulullah would say to him, Ya Ali, do you not hear the cries of the heavens? The cries of the heavens were, La fata illa Ali, wa la sayfa illa dhul fiqar. There is no youth like Ali and there is no sword like dhul fiqar. Indeed, what had happened was that the Muslim army had lost a number of martyrs. The most prominent was Hamza, the uncle of the Holy Prophet, who was killed by a man by the name of Al-Wahshi, commanded by Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, who was seeking revenge for what happened in Badr and the killing of her father. The Prophet of Islam was deeply saddened by what happened to his uncle Hamza and wept over his body. At the same time, the faithful, loyal companion Mus'ab bin Umair who had been sent to Yathrib by Rasulullah to recite the Quran and to attain the support of the people was also martyred in Uhud together with the father of Jabir by the name of Abdullah al-Ansari and several others. The Prophet of Islam commanded that certain of them were buried in that region and others who wanted to be buried in Baqir were taken to that cemetery. This is the battle site of the famous Battle of Uhud that happened in the year 3 after Hijra outside the city of Medina. Behind me is the cemetery which houses the bodies of the martyrs of Uhud, including the uncle of the Holy Prophet Hamza, Mus'ab ibn Umair, and other martyrs who fell here in this particular battle. At the same time, this particular battle demonstrated the bravery of the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. The famous line, La fata illa Ali, wa la sayfa illa dhul fiqar. 
was very much said in this particular region where he stood to defend the Holy Prophet and the religion of Islam. Right in front of me is the particular mount which the archers unfortunately deserted their positions and disobeyed the Holy Prophet. The Quran talks about this particular event, this incident, as an important one during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet. It taught many uh, lessons to Muslims that they were not guaranteed any victory, that the victory of Allah comes when they stand with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. That their disobedience uh, was tantamount to this particular loss. That over 70 were martyred here in the battlefield in the month of Shawwal, three years after the migration. The Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam after burying the body of Sayyid uh, Hamza, he would weep and cry and grief. And at the same time, he would instruct the Muslims to hold these sessions of mourning for Hamza alayhi salam. Sayyidat al-Nisa, Fatima al-Zahra salawatullahi wa salamu alayha would come and pay her respects and visit the grave of her uncle Hamza many a times. And it is said that she made the tasbih from the soil of the grave of Hamza here in Uhud.